welcome to the Web Platform Podcast, a developer discussion that dives deep into all things web. We discuss topics relevant to developing for the modern web and the web platform of today, tomorrow, and beyond. Hello, and welcome to another episode of the Web Platform Podcast, episode number 135, Hyper HTML. We are your host today, Justin Ribeiro and Mr. Leon Rivel. Hello, everybody. And before we introduce our guest this week, I'm going to throw it back over to Leon, who's going to talk about this week in the web in two minutes or less. Leon. Thank you. So first up, TypeScript 2.5 RC is now available, which includes a new ECMAScript feature allowing you to omit the error variable in catch statements. There's only a couple of days left to submit talk proposals for Nation.js, which is a full stack developer conference happening in Washington DC on December the 1st this year. A new site created by Rob Dodson called Custom Elements Everywhere has been released, which scores popular JavaScript frameworks on their compatibility with custom elements. The Polymer team has announced Lit HTML at the Polymer Summit. Lit HTML allows you to write HTML templates with template literals and efficiently render and re-render them to the DOM. And there's more on this later on in the episode. Another update from the Polymer Summit, Polymer has announced support for NPM and JavaScript modules. And that's all this week from This Week in Web. Thank you, Leon. Uh, I'm sure Rob's... Uh, it must be hard to log into Twitter right now. Custom ever elements everywhere and framework in the same sentence. I can only imagine. <laughs> <laughs> You know, getting their scores and things. I did take a look at it. It's pretty trick. I know Rob's been working real hard on that. So kudos, Rob, for diving in and trying to sort out lots and lots of specs. <laughs> and speaking of specs and things, uh, this week we're talking about Hyper HTML, and our guest today is none other than the author. Hello, Andrea. Good Hello. to see you. <laughs> <laughs> for those of people who are out there who uh, don't know you, uh, give a little bit about yourself. Hello, everybody. I'm Andrea Giammarchi, uh, also known as Web Reflection on Twitter. And uh, I'm a, let's say, web developer or full stack. I do everything that has to be with the web, but not only recently. I'm working on uh, also Internet of Things thing. And uh, I, I try to, whatever there is software or open source, I, I, I'm trying to be there and, um, and uh, do and have fun to be honest I'm recently I'm, I'm working on many interesting projects so that's what I do these days and HyperHTML is uh, my let's say latest um, I would say technology it's not really a technology it's just connecting few dots and using the platform and standards as much as I can and uh, and yeah and uh, we're here to talk about this so bring it on <laughs> ask me questions <laughs> <laughs> Brilliant. Um, so yeah, so from the very top then, if you could just give us like a high level overview of what Hyper HTML is before we get into any more specific questions. Okay. So Hyper HTML is basically um, HTML on steroids, I would say. Uh, it, it's based on template literals, uh, ECMAScript 2015 or ECMAScript 6. And uh, is basically a new way to or an innovative way to use template literals, all the 100% of the power of template literals, which is not just interpolating JavaScript values uh, inside the string, um, the special multi-line strings, uh, is also using few special features that not everyone knows about template literals, which is the, uh, the, the fact that every template literal is unique in all its static parts. Um, as a frozen array, so it's uh, something you can relate easily with a map, for instance, or uh, just an array of references, and uh, and it also uh, allows you to uh, to to use a function up front that basically automatically will be a tag. In this case, it's called like a template tag, and this function will receive without even needing to invoke such function. When you put this function name in front of the template literal, it will receive this static frozen uh, unique array uh, with all the static parts and also all the interpolated values. Um, basically, HyperHTML does something that uh, Justin Fagnani uh, explained today, since you mentioned already uh, lit HTML, they basically do uh, very, very, very similar things. So uh, the first time this string is uh, received, it's 
it's used to, to create a template object, a template, a real HTML template object, inject this content and traverse only once the DOM node and basically find map one to one all the interpreted values to uh, to either attributes or text content or list of nodes or in some case even promises because the cool part about template literals is that when you use a tag you don't necessarily need to return a string you can either return an object or anything else that can compose nicely with all the surrounding uh, parts of your of your application and this technique is uh, it doesn't work just on the DOM, it works also if you want on the back end. So there are applications everywhere to use a similar pattern. So you parse once the string the, the, the static part of the template literals with any technology you want. In the hyper HTML case, it's gonna use the DOM, but in the uh, in other uh, in other cases, in other projects, it's gonna use the uh, I don't know. It could use the JS DOM. It could use some uh, mock of the of the DOM itself, or it could just parse whatever it is, even XML, and uh, and compile or transform all the parsed stuff into something else and work out of the box without necessarily creating a string. It can even create an interaction with a uh, with a with a system like it is in some case for native script and uh, the native script XML. So I'm already putting a lot on the plate, but basically the, the potential of the, 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 the pattern used in, in hyper HTML uh, basically opened doors to many other environments and not just the DOM. But the hyper HTML, the hyper is the, uh, the same prefix of uh, hypertext. <laughs> it's also uh, many complained about the name, but it's actually, these are two different words. Um, but the hyper HTML is uh, the, the, let's say the front end part of the, of the pattern. Um, and it's working well, it's a uh, six month old and it's already went from version zero to version one, it was mostly uh, driven, the, the, the major update, most, mostly driven by uh, all early users and customers, uh, let's, let's call them customers, but they were basically just uh, developers helping me figure out where uh, I should have improved, uh, where I should have removed bits that were either complicated or foot gun. So there were early mistakes and uh, this has been solved, but is now uh, released as a one dot X version and is quite mature and compatible with a uh, uh, browser starting from i9 to every other browser you can think of. I just presume the word hyper HTML in the, you know, in, in the naming was just that you'd given HTML too much sugar. Like I legitimately thought, you know, I feel like, you know, it's just hyped up, you know, in terms of just running around doing actual stuff. Because realistically, I mean, it, it's built on top of temporal literals. And I'm always curious because I find developers that don't or who have not yet heard of temperate literals. Could you explain a little bit about what the basic of a temporal literal is? Like, what does that mean in the in the scope of things? And like, why should developers care? Okay, so template literals are, let's say, the, the latest version of uh, uh, JavaScript string. So, you know, historically, you can write JavaScript strings inside a single quote or a double quote and uh, uh, the template literals is basically uh, a backtick. So you have uh, starting and ending backtick, and in the middle you can you can have any any string you want, and also you can have interpolated values. And um, interpolated values are basically just plain JavaScript. As long as you open uh, like like it would be for I don't know if you imagine mustache templating or any other sort of templating, they usually use um, uh, curly brackets to uh, to to address uh, the dynamic part of the template. With JavaScript template literals, uh, you basically just uh, open uh, um, an interpolated place for JavaScript to be like the real JavaScript with all the scope and context and whatever you need uh, is going to be there. And you just start with a dollar, open curly brackets, you put whatever expression you want in there, and you close with another curly brackets and uh, and that can be uh, inside a, a class method that could be inside a function and that could be also uh, not just once per string but in every in every part of the string you want 
and also interpolate uh, sorry uh, template literals uh, supports natively multiline so to write some HTML uh, becomes like very very natural and uh, let's say somehow familiar if you used to deal with the uh, old uh, inner HTML old dangerous scary <laughs> unsafe uh, and not too powerful inner HTML technique uh, once upon a time it was the fastest way to render something on the DOM now you can just use interpolated values to bring in the value you need but if you put a function that is gonna intercept uh, before the values are uh, merged into the string and it's gonna intercept the the whole static parts of the of the template or of the string that you are trying to uh, interpolate of this literal template uh, basically you can intercept all the values up front create the structure you wanna this the static part of the structure you want to parse once and then address like the attribute the single attribute the the, the DOM node text content or whatever you want uh, parsing traversing the, 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 the DOM only once and then update whenever it's needed whenever you call the same template literal twice it's gonna be the same template literal so there's nothing to parse again because you've done that already and so you can update just the uh, address node right away without even uh, needing any virtual DOM or anything. So it's basically, you are able through template literals to create a map uh, from the interpolated values and anything else. Anything else in this case is the DOM, but like I've said before, it could even be uh, binary code. I don't know, it, it really, it's really up to you what you need the interpolated values for. Yeah, so the you know template literals was such a huge feature of ES6. Like for the first time, you can write um, HTML and CSS as a string in JavaScript, where you get proper syntax highlighting, and it actually feels nice instead of the horrible you know syntax you used to have to write before. To get multi lines, you have to do like you know plus and equals and enters, and it was just so difficult to work with. And of course, you wouldn't get any syntax highlighting in there. Am I, am but with I, template literals, you do. If I can stop you there for a second, the syntax highlighting unfortunately is uh, not automatic. It's not like a JSX. If you use React JSX, you have highlighting um, automatically. But if you put a string inside the template literals, you have highlighting, but you have highlighting of the JavaScript. So all the interpolated values are going to be highlighted, but the, the actual HTML surrounding HTML is not going to be highlighted unless you have some um, ID plugin or some, uh, uh, let's say, uh, tool that helps you doing that. Yeah. Yeah, but a lot of it's not out of the box. That's that's what I said. That's the only missing bit I would say compared to JSX. Or the a lot of the popular IDEs such as WebStorm and Sublime and that kind of stuff, you know, have this kind of enabled by default, so you don't really need to do much um, to get that additional yeah, support. Yeah, I'm, I'm, I still use VIM from time to time, so that's, <laughs> <laughs> that's what I'm saying. It's not it's not really out of the box, but yeah, or yeah. It's okay. I mean, if you have a good ID and um, and also there are libraries coming out, so every tool needed to make it better is going to be there, which is cool. So, given the nature that temporal little temporal te, given given that Template. template literals exist out there, I mean, in the land of I mean, because I've seen I mean, you know as well as I do, there's been a lot of temperate literal libraries out there in the course of things, because temperate literals have been a sort of a known thing within the spec for a while. People have played with them and done some other libs that are on top. I mean, how did you come to the conclusion that you're like, you know what, hyper HTML, I'm going to write this thing, it's going to do some cool stuff. Like, were you inspired to write this by something else? Did you look or did you just look at the spec and say to yourself, you know what? I gotta, this is going to be trick. I can do some cool stuff. got to be honest, I was rather uh, desperate <laughs> when I invented <laughs> this solution. Um, uh, basically, I've worked with uh, both startups and also corporates. And sometimes in the working environments, uh, there is this, this thing like in-house frameworks. Um, and I, I once found myself that to just create a form, a change one select uh, and one checkbox and relate these two things uh, through a state. Uh, I, I think that day in, I wasted four hours or something more um, because I was using a framework that I wasn't familiar with and um, it was in-house. It wasn't so well documented and at the same time it was very very over engineered for little simple tasks like this i mean it was able to do many things but not simple things and simple things were most of my job daily um so that day i've done something 
very simple. I, I I've used all my skills, which is using using the platform uh, like uh, vanilla JavaScript and HTML and CSS. And that day, I've just shown um, at that time my my colleague, uh, I've shown the same thing created in 20 minutes, and that was working twice as fast. It was requiring zero tooling, and it was it was just working, and it was just better compatible, and it was just incredibly simple to, to, to put it down because it was just HTML, some CSS and JavaScript, and the, the classic the classic old style uh, and it worked perfectly well. And so that day I realized, damn, how can I, how can I actually simplify this thing? Um, few days after, I discover it's something I, I usually read all the specifications of every JavaScript version, ECMAScript version. Um, there was one thing I've missed about template literals is that the, the static part is really always the same reference uh, if the template is always the same. You don't receive a new array of static parts. So the first argument of a, of a, of a function that you can put up front a template literal will receive always the same static frozen array that nobody can change so it's also is also very safe um and that was the 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 click uh, because that that was connecting in my mind okay i have a, a single reference that is unique and is unique per static parts and the static part is all i know all i need to know because interpolations are what are going to change in the future but the static parts are never going to change and that's the same when we use when we define mustache templates or any other kind of templates you can think of you can manually write any templates there's a lot of html that is just static and then suddenly you put the hello user or the login form or the on click event and all these kind of stuff Th those are the only thing that you want to change or set up easily at runtime. And so that day I, I thought, okay, I can relate a template to, to what? Um, how about I parse this thing once? Instead, I don't want to create a virtual DOM representation of the whole thing because I don't need a virtual DOM representation of the whole thing. And I, I just want to traverse, find out what I need to update the next time I render this thing. Um, and that's it. And when I will receive any new update, it's going to be always the amount of interpolations that are going to be changed or are going to update the DOM uh, I'm representing with that little template literals uh, are always be the same amount of interpolations and are always going to have a value because that's how uh, template literals work. So it's a static uh, first argument and a static amount. So it's, uh, it's, it's easy to uh, pre-cache every operation that you want to do there. And so like over the weekend, that that time over the weekend, I created the very first version of HyperHTML, which was using uh, was joining these uh, static pieces of the template uh, through a comment. Uh, why a comment? Because a comment was already splitting all the all the node text and everything inside the HTML for me, and this comment was there parsed by native HTML parser. I didn't have to do anything and, and it was giving me all the placeholder that I could use to put a text content or a list of nodes or even inside an attribute I could just check that the attribute content was this comment and the comment had a special content as well so it was blazing fast uh, also to traverse very uh, very secure there was no way to uh, to create uh, confusion or to make the parser fail, and uh, and that was that was it. That was the, the the first time I thought, okay, this is gonna work, and I and I tried, and it did work, and it was around uh, less than two kilobytes. So the first the first implementation was was deadly small and fast, uh, and I was I was happy. But there were many things that. Um, that needed to be improved, especially in terms of compatibility and everything else. So let's say that these six months uh, were necessary to to make the library mature and reach the current status. That's really cool to hear, especially you know how you mentioned the clicking point was was understanding um, you know the, the static nature of those kind of things. Um, so you've. You mentioned um, one of the benefits over virtual DOM, um, but could you describe in a little bit more detail, um, you know, uh, why um, why HyperHTML is a v virtual DOM alternative? Um, what are the benefits of using it over virtual DOM? Or just describe in a little bit more detail that so, you know the story behind that. Sure. Um, let's say uh, let, let's start to what problem virtual DOM is trying to solve. Um, so basically, the reason virtual DOM is a thing is because 
traversing DOM, uh, querying the DOM, uh, you can use any modern technique uh, you prefer, even get element by ID, you can create thousands of ID. It's still quite slow if you do that every single time you want to update uh, your tree. Um, and so the virtual DOM does something, does something smart. It creates a virtual tree of the current structure, but to do that, it needs to understand, to traverse the entirety of the of the tree anyway because otherwise you cannot have a one-to-one -one, uh, one -one, um, representation and then where sh where the virtual DOM shines is where he has all the algorithms to uh, at that point don't touch the DOM anymore just figure out on this virtual tree uh, what are the changes that should be reflected on the DOM and uh, and once he, he finds out in the most best algorithm, smartest way ever to all the differences, um, it will update only the, the, the part that needs to be updated on the DOM. Uh, this, is, this is cool and that was the, uh, this is what, why virtual DOM worked uh, for and is scaled. Um, but at the same time, uh, if you think about it, once you have the necessity to traverse at least once, for the first time, the entirety of the DOM tree. Um, what if instead of creating a copy of this DOM tree, you just address directly the, the, the bit on the DOM that you eventually are going to update? And eventually is the key. So you don't want to update every single time every part of the tree that needs updates. You want to update only when the, the content or when the, 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 the DOM node or whatever is there is different. Um, and so, how about you have a, a very simple way to, to, to understand differences, which is still based on DOM nodes. You drop completely the, the virtual representation of the DOM, uh, which in, in turns, it means that somehow you are saving memory um, because you don't need to have a, co a copy, a full copy of everything that is there. It's just you interact directly with all the DOM nodes that are there anyway. There's no way you can escape that. And also at the same time, at the end of the day, the virtual DOM has to change and manipulate the DOM. And, uh, and how about you directly do that instead of having this intermediate step? Now, I don't, it's, it's very hard. Every, every benchmark I've tried to, to create and compare with every alternative based on virtual DOM, at the end of the day, it looks like we are all very, very close. So there is this DB monster. This um, is it's a famous benchmark that is showing, I think, uh, hundreds, uh, two hundreds rows in a table with uh, uh, five cells plus uh, the description. It has some CSS, some class, some, and this is updating as much as it can, as fast as it can. The aim is to reach 60 frames per second, which uh, apparently nobody does because it's, uh, it's, uh, it's we need probably uh, faster computers to do that. But we are all close to the to those 50 frames per seconds on uh, on an average update of 100 rows per time, and uh, and and that's that's actually incredible. And all the all the comparison you can find online, there is a Mitril, uh, there is React, there is uh, all these virtual DOM based alternatives um, compared to HyperHTML. They are they are quite there. They are all almost as fast as everyone, as everybody, uh, every, everybody else, but at the same time, HyperHTM is it's simpler, so it's smaller. The library itself, it, it, right now, with all the uh, feature detections and all the bugs fixes that it has inside to, to patch in any way the browser, because it still needs some some patching, a uh, few browsers, um, but it's four kilobytes. And if you compare four kilobytes, that is manipulating directly the DOM uh, to the, 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 the abstraction that brings the virtual DOM, the, the size of that abstraction and the extra RAM and extra uh, manipulation that is going to be offline and online. At the end of the day, we all do the same thing. So we all need to update the bloody DOM because the DOM is what is our view. So it's what needs to be manipulated. You cannot escape that. And so I would say what everybody will need uh, ideally today is a mechanism to tell the browser, browser, can you please don't do anything because I have to manipulate you. And now when I stop it, you can do whatever you want and optimize all the manipulation at once. And that's unfortunately not possible uh, because I've asked this uh, once already in some mailing list and they told me that it's, uh, it's, it's very hard to have something like that. It's actually 
he goes down to legacy and uh, he goes down to the inability to, uh, to basically to prevent the browser from propagating change because every time you remove a node or you add a node, if there is some listener, it has to be triggered and stuff like that. So I would say we are all at the end my, taking a, a DOM tree, figuring out what needs to be updated and then doing that. You can put a virtual DOM in the middle that's going to be smarter and probably there are many cases where it's going to be uh, faster than my uh, current library, especially when there are a lot of uh, mixed up rows uh, in, a, uh, in a big list. I don't, I, don't, I don't do much smart things there. I just create a list of a fragment with a list of things and I put it there and I trash it there. And so far it worked well and it scaled well in performance, performance speaking. But then we, we, we end up manipulating the DOM. So if you drop that virtual DOM bit, you can surely have a smaller uh, footprint. Um, not necessarily faster, but not even slower library. And, uh, and, and also, if you need to debug something, <laughs> it's actually easier because you then have this intermediate layer um, that, that is a, a, another huge piece of library that could be a, a virtual DOM one. I mean, it is tough, right? I mean, there are so many different use cases that people use things like virtual DOM for today where I, I, I always sometimes go, do, do you really need the virtual DOM for that? <laughs> uh, you know, because there's, there in a lot of cases, like, you know, again, it's, it, it's sort of become one of the things that, you know, people tell you, like, I'm just going to use the virtual DOM. And then you go, D do you know what the virtual DOM is? <laughs> Um, you know, it always, you know, because there are so many different approaches that, you know, can utilize the existing platform uh, that give you quite a bit of performance on, on top without having to deal with, um, you know, particularly some of the memory usage that virtual DOM is going to give you in, in certain cases. Yeah, it would be the the thing is not it's not too easy to compare. Um, but oh, yeah. you you have the, the data you have is the library size, uh, which means also the complexity and how easy it is to maintain a four mm -hmm. kilobyte library compared to uh, thirty, fifty, or hundred. I don't know, GZIP speaking, um, and then that's the GZIP version. So you have also to think how bigger is going to be um, the, the the whole logic behind. Um, I don't are... envy them. I'll tell you that much. <laughs> Well, there are pros and cons, uh, I guess. The, there are reasons for having Virtual DOM, but also Virtual DOM was born when template literals were not there yet and were not, um, uh, I don't think, were not popular and also non fully specced. So there were a few behaviors that people wouldn't think at that time that could be used instead of needing even JSX or, or, or anything that is going to find the differences at runtime. Um, it, it's, that's the cool part about standards that keep evolving and improving and uh, and so I, I guess is a natural um, natural pattern to uh, to keep following standards and try to embrace them as much as possible and to be honest I don't think uh, I once created a sort of little rant um, the blog post was called uh, the DOM is not slow your abstraction is um, that I received a lot of critics um, that were right because, I mean, there is always a trade-off. So what I've shown at that time, it was a, a little script, but the little script was so convoluted and complex to, to, to understand and maintain that I also think nobody should do that. And then the, the, all, the whole HyperHTML uh, thing is that you can create the same DB monster. It was at that time. It was also DB monster, and that that was the fastest DB monster I've ever seen. But at the time, I created with H, HyperHTML the same DB monster with even less line of code, and it was extremely clean, and it was basically as fast as the pure DOM implementation that was targeting directly only nodes, and it was just updating text content when it when it was needed. Um, and so that that was the key. So once you find a better way to do things. Maybe you should, if, it's, if it comes from the standard platform, maybe you should start thinking about embracing them uh, instead of moving away from the standards because at the end of the day, what you, your underlying core layer, your, your, your most close to the metal layer is going to be standards anyway. So Amen. I, I always prefer to, to stick with them. Yeah. I would prefer to, to be as, as close as possible to, the, to, to, to what the platform has to offer and not diverge too much. 
Yeah, and you also said that um, HyperHTML, it sounds like it's got a very good uh, browser compatibility story as well, all the way back to IE9. But obviously, IE9 doesn't support template literals. So kind of how does that work? What's the story there? So basically, HyperHTML is written in uh, ECMAScript. Uh, I won't say five because there's some functionality, but the, 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 the standard I've used to create the library is ECMAScript 3. So basically, theoretically, the code is compatible even with IE8 or, or, or lower. Um, the i9 thing is that if you, um, if you, if you use the uh, bubble uh, transpiler only for the template literals, so and I'm not talking about the, the whole transpilation thing, I'm just talking about your code, you, you use your daily code that your company that uh, is probably behind because of some legacy support and stuff like that, maybe you have old code, um, you can start writing template literals, that's the only new addition that you can put on your code and use Bubble to transform, to transpile only template literals and Bubble there are a few transformations that are not real one-to-one uh, -one perfect uh, like the classes, the native classes can be somehow problematic but the template literals, they got it right and it is very well transformed and also the, the fact that if you use the same template literals twice is, uh, is going to produce, is going to result into the same uh, st uh, frozen static array. Uh, that's awesome. So it's the only thing that you need and being the only transformer that theoretically you need, well at that time if you have to set up tooling at that point just go all in yes 2015. But what I'm saying is that if you just go for the template literals, your uh, deployment uh, sp speed shouldn't be affected much because the, that transpilation is very fast um, and costs nothing and it also adds pretty much nothing to the uh, to the size, to the final size. It doesn't bloat the output to the final output. It's just uh, you, you keep your code as it is and you just uh, have uh, compatibility with the template literals. And there is also a live test on my repository that shows basically the, the, the transformed uh, test is, a, is the entirety of the suite that does 100% code coverage and is running also on i9. And uh, when I've seen the first time that i9 was green, uh, uh, <laughs> I was very happy. I was like, oh, wow, <laughs> how, did, how is this possible? And basically, all, all I've done is just to add the, trans, the transpilation of uh, template literals in the middle. And, and I think, I, I, I don't remember now, but probably for i9, you might need also the, the ES5 uh, shim and sham, the, 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 the good old polyfill. But there is a way to load that only in some browser, so you don't really need to bloat your page with polyfills. You just put polyfill if you need uh, the object uh, define property. That's probably the only thing you need because everything else is uh, uh, is just standard JavaScript. There's no, I didn't go too fancy on on, on modern features, and there is an, uh, um, th there is also a little uh, weak map, little little polyfill, little shim inside the code, and a little map shim in case it doesn't work. There are also, uh, an is array. There are a few things that are already monkey patched uh, within the library itself, um, with a very few lines of code. It's just what I need inside the library. So all private scope, no global scope pollution, nothing. Um, and, and, and that's it, and that just, just works also on older Android phones, which is, which is great. I, I always like to support, if it doesn't take much effort, I always like to support as many browsers as I can. Yeah, the effort to support those, I can only hope eventually goes down. Like, as someone who has to deal with legacy things too, I, you know, I, it's good to support the things uh, that you can. What but, I've discovered? You know... If I didn't have to support them, I would be okay with that. Okay. I readily admit um, it. <laughs> what, I, what I've discovered, uh, and it's just recently, to be honest, is that once you have a really good um, coverage and a suite of tests, when you have many tests, um, at that point, you just run the test against whatever browser you want to uh, you want to fix and you have already everything in there and so you're going to just fix few tests one per one per time hopefully not everything is red and uh, and and you will see when when you manage to fix one thing maybe many other things will be fixed automatically and at the same time this is uh, you you're always going to learn some quirk that is not good it's something that you want to forget i, I, did, I didn't want to know this <laughs> damn you i but um it's, there's always to learn something and at the same time uh, the 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 test helps a lot to, to do this. So even refactoring and everything. I, uh, the, the, lately, I'm just going for 100% test coverage or nothing. Just 
I, I don't want to I don't want to go on because I don't know if it's gonna work um, that gives me the little little sense of uh, security that whatever whatever browser I'm gonna try um, I can I can fix it or I can find out what's not working and figure out and solve it and there was a lot to fix in this little library because uh, Firefox uh, before the version 55 it was buggy they they were not sending the frozen static unique array as a first parameter of a tag a template literal function tag and that was and driving the browser crazy because it was creating every time a new template because it wasn't recognizing it so I had to patch that um, and what else there were a few things like uh, Internet Explorer if you if you if you inject a string with the attributes a and then attribute B with two different values maybe maybe just maybe if the attribute is a class or something else uh, it swaps randomly attributes and so you have to figure out what the hell is doing <laughs> and how and there are a few things that are always like fun to to deal with the platform because there, there is a reason if we keep developing frameworks there there are so many quirks in this in the web platform um, but it's if it's not too bad to fix all the things and four kilobytes mean if I then gzipped I don't think is a huge um, is a huge uh, problem for the web I mean I've read the the, the average is three megabytes of, of websites I don't think the four kilobytes that can solve many problems at once including uh, improving performance uh, I think is a is a good uh, is, I will give it a chance and <laughs> see how it goes. It always it, it always intrigues me that uh, I'm just always so confused when people complain about, oh, your polyfill and or fix is, you know, 4K or 10K or 15 or what some number. And you're sitting there going, you have like a 1.5 meg unoptimized image on your front page. <laughs> like, and you're complaining about the polyfill? Like, I think your priorities are slightly askew at that yeah. point. Yeah, I think the, the the problem is also how we keep uh, advertising performance because if we keep just checking the the, the milliseconds to to render the first bit. Of course, if you need polyfills up front, polyfills are something that you cannot just load asynchronously. If you need them, you really need them. So it's gonna slow down. Um, and when you compare performance, is always like a factor that, for me, in my opinion, should be ruled out by any. Uh, benchmark because uh, if you need it there's nothing else you can do I mean either you propose to support as many browsers as you can to so, so, to be as cross browser as you can or uh, or you count the milliseconds um, there are techniques to 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 do both or, or, so penalize only uh, old browsers uh, somebody even use a user agent sometimes is the it can be on the server side it can be the most efficient way to say okay um, I, I'm just I know that this browser is very old I'm gonna throw this polyfill that is gonna figure out by all the feature possible all the feature detections uh, what's gonna work and what's gonna not uh, in my case I never uh, I always try to avoid the user agent sniffing but uh, sometimes I just put maybe a little I don't know which one is worst. Sometimes I put a little script on top of the page. It's like, is function bind there? Because if not, I need to polyfill for sure. So if function bind is not there, I just uh, document to write whatever polyfill before having other scripts. And that's also a workaround that works and it doesn't disturb uh, theoretically. It's very bad to use document write. But since you're using document write to patch older browsers that they don't care about document write, so you always work there. Uh, maybe you can go for this kind of solution. So it's always a sort of trade-off and uh, and for sure polyfill are a great way to go. Um, but I remember uh, the last year especially, there, were, there was some talk from, uh, I think it was Christian Hellman. The, he, he said that he, polyfills are great, but you should, you, you should not forget polyfill there because if you're gonna bloat for no reason, even modern browsers, or well, you're gonna keep uh, patching stuff that shouldn't be patched anymore, then you are hurting both yourself, uh, your business, and the user. Um, so it's always good to feature detect as much as, much as you can. And uh, I, I wish there was a standardized way to inject polyfill only when you need it. Uh, who does, uh, now that I think about it, who does the user agent sniffing? Uh, I think it's the um, polyfill IO services. Uh, I think they do, you, you just pass the URL and if your browser supports this, this or that, the, the, the service automatically gives you uh, whatever the browser needs. So that's the way to go and that worked for the New York Times so far. So I think it's kind of reliable. Yeah, and I, I know that the, I think it's in the 
Polymer Org repos now. They have browser compatibility check, which will actually give you feature sets based on UA sniffing. It's a node module that they, I think they 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 forked it as something. They had another project they were working on because I saw it the other day. It landed in I think that org and I played with it to see what kind of what it returned out and it will let you basically return multi builds. So if you have a purple vase server or whatnot, and I think I, I think there's some call for that. I mean, I, but again, like it sort of depends on what you're trying to deliver to. Like in our corporate apps, as I'm sure your corporate apps, like I can get away with, you know, a, a one build that's fairly performant. Uh, I'm pretty happy because one, it's legacy. I don't have all the tests. It's a pain in the neck to deal with. And those are, that's a different problem as opposed to, oh, here's my greenfield thing that I'm now building from scratch and I can deliver it on anything I want. Um, you know, there's, there's, again, like you said, trade-offs, right? There's always trade-offs. Yeah, sure. So, um, as we learned from, uh, this week in web and um, Polymer's just announced lit HTML, um, which is very similar from what it seems to, um, hyper HTML. And I know you've been getting loads of questions from people about what is the difference. Um, and you've created a really cool gist to kind of describe the differences, which we can share in the, um, in the show notes, but could you just describe for us now, uh, any differences or, or similarities between lit HTML and hyper HTML? Oh, so they, if you, it's hilarious because if you if you check the the very entry point um, of the two libraries, uh, the the only difference you can see is that uh, lit HTML is written in TypeScript. <laughs> um, they do exactly the same thing. Uh, so they try to get the the template and they figure out if it's there. If it's not, they parse it once, they store it, and they they they, they return. They update the template and return it uh, updated. Um, and every success, success uh, every next update uh, is going to use the same object and update with the new interpolated values. Uh, if you check really the, the the first five lines of these two libraries, you you see this. Uh, this is I don't know. It, it's it's unbelievable how how similar these are. Um, then you see you go into details and you see that uh, they 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 wrote in the in the repository itself that is very experimental. Uh, it's under uh, Polymer Lab, so it's not an official library yet. I've heard today at the Polymer Summit that uh, Justin was saying that he was going to release on npm, I think, uh, but. I mean, it's, it's clear it's still experimental. In uh, writing down that gist, comparing this uh, uh, hyper HTML and lit HTML, uh, I found like five bugs today, and I, I created also, I filed to their repository five bugs. Uh, I'm happy that today they mentioned the, uh, hyper HTML uh, during the talk, uh, but I was a bit surprised because I, I talked to them. Um, they, they know, I mean, I don't know Justin, in person uh, or directly, I didn't talk to Justin before the end of June, um, but I've talked with uh, many other uh, colleagues of him. And uh, and also there's this uh, uh, Viper HTML uh, on the Hacker News uh, uh, PWA uh, competition or sort of show off of every, every, every framework and technology that's trying to bring uh, Hacker News PWA uh, to the web and, uh, and Viper HTML uh, today is still uh, number speaking, is still data speaking, is still the fastest. So it's hard to me to believe that nobody knew about it, and yet the, there was no no mention. But if you look closer, they do exactly the same thing in just slightly different ways. Um, Lit HTML is trying to um, is, is, is trying to use. Uh, let's say a different paradigm because it's based on internal classes and it's trying to figure out internally through its own classes uh, what to do. And HyperHTML basically works with the uh, DOM nodes and arrays internally. So there's really nothing <laughs> special. And uh, it really, that's one of the reasons it works out of the box down to i9. Uh, while uh, LitHTML, for instance, because they, uh, they, they probably don't know or they never tested or they don't care right now because it's experimental, they don't know that IE has this attribute issue. And so one of the bug I filed today is that, hey guys, um, you, you, it's not reliable because we, if I set few attributes, including the class, and the class is especially the class is uh, a very important attribute for every DOM node. Um, if you, instead of setting the class name uh, to the class attribute, you set the 
the class name to the uh, on click event. Uh, that's not going to work. <laughs> so it's um, I think it's a uh, it's interesting because when lit HTML came out. Uh, also gave me a few hints on what uh, what was going on. So it, it, it confirmed that the the pattern I was using was uh, was cool because if after six months uh, the Google Labs come out with a very similar solution, it means that the pattern has potential. And, um, and at the same time, I've seen that they were doing something better than the Hyper HTML something worse than HyperHTML. So it gave me hints to, to improve even more my library. So I would say today, as of today, HyperHTML is definitely more compatible, more mature, and uh, they will figure out and will find out all the issue I had uh, in developing HyperHTML. And most of them are described in this gist, and uh, there are five bugs that will help them to mature very quickly uh, the, the library uh, and I've struggled for let's say, let's say months to figure out how to solve all the issue. Um, so I'm happy to help. Uh, I just wish there was, uh, they, they would have talked to me a bit more before going all in with this new project. Also because I'm, I, I have a lot of helps from many developers, especially on the documentation side. Um, but library wise, uh, is is just it's just me right now. So when you wake up one day and you figure out the Google is is doing the same, it's just six months later and with a different library. Uh, that wasn't the best feeling that morning, um, but it was good. Uh, Justin mentioned in a, uh, in, in, a, in an issue where we were discussing about this, uh, it's good to to have some little competition so we can probably find out what's the best way to go and maybe one day it will become a standard pattern and if that happens uh, it will be it will be great it will be awesome because all the uh, tooling around will be uh, there by default you don't need anything special it will just work i do find it interesting that you know in so many ways that the standard sort of operated where you had to have two implementation of something to verify it before really it became part of the standard as it used to be years ago so I don't know that that's the same case. It seems that way with a lot of ideas like Hyper, uh, HTML, and everything else. Where, I, I, like, I in, in the back of my head, I have to believe there's going to be at least two or three more that are going to pop up over this course of things. Um, Probably, you know. And as a as as I can, as you mentioned, to continue to sort of verify the pattern, because a, a lot of times, you know, for all the for all the ones that were have been successful, like Hyper HTML. And you know who knows if lit will be successful or not, right? It's still experimental, and it's it's it may it may eventually get to npm, but it's not there now, as far as I'm I'm aware. You know, will you know will some go by the wayside? Will others rise to just sort of the top? Uh, it's the kind of nice thing about the web. Uh, you know, one is that you know, as someone who uses many of them, um, I get to break things. <laughs> <laughs> and file tickets, which is a personal, you know, favorite of mine uh, because I, I also like fixing things. So, uh, you know, I, I think, yeah, competition is always good. Uh, and if it leads to better standards, I, I think, well, <laughs> I know the three of us are all on board with the more standards, please. Uh, I feel like it, it ends up being win-win uh, down the line. Yeah. Uh, the, the only thing that's... Um... I wish there were more standards interested uh, into into this this pattern because right now, well, okay, there is a Google team working on it uh, as an experiment. Um, and now I hope that I can collaborate with, uh, uh, I don't know, maybe with Mozilla, maybe with, with with Microsoft. I mean, this is, I think there is something in this pattern that is is cool because it's fully based on on on, on the platform and. Uh, it's the first time in years that I see something based on the platform that meanwhile ECMAScript is very mature uh, and improved a lot. Uh, so all this effort is coming together. The web is, is a better place. The browser support is a better place. If I if I could remove all the all the little gotchas because of supporting all the browsers, the library will be one kilobyte less probably. And so there are many things that uh, it, we are getting there and the, the effort to make things fast and work um, the way you expect, uh, probably in my case, since about ever, <laughs> um, 
is uh, the, the effort is, is less and less. But yes, it's tough. So web development is not has never been easy. And uh, but these days, at least the browser support and browsers are are, are more aligned. Um, all all fast. The hardware is better. Uh, mobile is better. So there's I, th I think is it went is going to the right in the right direction. So it's I don't know if it's how long it's gonna take to be fully uh, satisfied about the platform. Probably that will never happen. Uh, it will keep changing forever. Uh, but that's also good because as soon as there are new new patterns, new ideas, uh, we should always listen and try to uh, to improve and follow them when uh, when it's appropriate. If I can just get my cat gifs a little faster, that's that's basically my hallmark at this point for all things web. Did you deliver the cat gif faster than the last person? I don't know why we don't do more cat gif related demos. I feel like the Hacker News one's played out at this point. It's time for cat gif demos, people. <laughs> that's where all the performance is moving forward. You've heard it here first. We've decided. <laughs> <laughs> so um, we're, we're running up against time. So is there anything else um, that uh, we've not talked about that you'd really like to talk about before we finish up? Um, in my case, uh, like I've said uh, at the beginning, uh, the Hyper HTML is just one part of the pot. Um, there is Viper HTML, which is server-side rendering. Uh, you can reuse 100% of the same template on the on the on Node.js, serve the page and uh, pick it up uh, through the client and you, you basically write a template literal once and you share it with backend and frontend and you actually have the same rules and everything's gonna work automatically. Also asynchronous and then you can stream, that's the only extra thing that you can do on Node.js. And the, the, the pattern is uh, experimental on the native script side, so there is a native HTML as well, uh, which uh, the, the idea is to have, uh, to use these virtual representation of this mock representation of the DOM um, and, and basically translate all the all the, all the tags into native script XML tags and there is a team already that is working and that's already exciting but like I said at the beginning I would like to have more help from developers because by myself to uh, to, to, to follow up these three uh, actually the, there are four of them uh, these are cool projects that have a lot, they, they could, you could do a lot of things with that, but for sure I need better documentation, better tooling, better better, better everything, and any well, help will, will really help. Well, it uh, sounds like you've got so far already, I mean, it, such a cool library, does so much, um, and the documentation is already great, you've done some great examples, so um, yeah, if, if anybody wants to help on this, yeah, please. That would be great. <laughs> so uh, on that note, how can people get, get hold of you if they want to reach out? Uh, well, is, everything is on, is on GitHub. Uh, there is a website which is um, uh, viperhtml.js.org, and that's basically the viperhtml says the umbrella name, uh, mostly because hyperhtml was taken already. Um, but uh, yeah, it's basically the site where I'm trying to put uh, update documentation, put all examples. There is a comparison uh, between hyperhtml and React and Angular and Polymer and Vue.js and everything I can find online and just try to show people that uh, it's not it's not too difficult. Actually, it's not difficult at all to recreate whatever it is with any other framework. Uh, through Hyper HTML, and usually most of the time is uh, less uh, less bloat uh, on the on the final sites because the library is small, and the line of codes usually are also uh, fewer than uh, competitors. So there's really uh, I wish there, there there were big players already adopting it, but there's a lot of work to do, especially on the uh, documentation side and. Uh, I, I wish I could have uh, as, as much help as uh, as I can, and uh, and that's it. It's already great, but uh, it's never enough these days. So please help support the the project. That's what I'm saying. Well, fantastic. Well, thank you so much for being on the show today, kind sir. Thank you for inviting me, Leon. It's been episode number one hundred and thirty-five. Any final thoughts as we close out this wonderful episode? Use the platform. Help support open source projects. Thank you. Those are good final thoughts. I like it. And that's been episode number 135 of the Web Platform Podcast. Tune in next week when we talk more things web. <laughs>